practices and even the experiments of its own time. So this first section is called the deferral of painting. The directors of the first exhibition of the Society of Independent Artists held at the Grand Central Palace on Lexington Avenue in the spring of 1917 consisted of three groups. William Glackens, the president, George Bellows, Rockwell Kent, and Maurice Prendergast represented the Ashcan School, which dealt primarily with realistic subject matter, although Bellows um, entry for the independents, Cattle and Meadow Hills, 1916, used bright expressionist color to create mood. Alfred Stieglitz's 291 group was represented by John Marin. Stieglitz was not on the board, but he and Paul Strand did contribute some earlier photographs, namely the wonderful and famous The Steerage of 1907, great photograph, uh, to the exhibition. The third group was drawn from the Ahrensberg Circle. Ahrensberg himself was the managing director and included Duchamp, Man Ray, Joseph Stella, John Covert, and Morton Chamber. Duchamp was also chosen to be the chairman of the three-man hanging committee. I love that. The others were Bellows and Kent, right? Um, and irony, here, here's the, here are the committee. See the committee? There's Marcel Duchamp, the chairman of the hanging committee, with Bellows and Kent. So he's very active in all this. And that was an irony, since he himself was no longer making paintings. It was Duchamp who came up with the notion that the sequence of the exhibits to be hung in alphabetical order, as had the paintings in the earlier 1910 exhibition of independent artists, should be determined by drawing a letter from a hat. The arbitrariness of this procedure, the letter turned out to be R, so the first a room of paintings were all R paintings that began, the artist's name began with R, caused consternation among society members. The powerful artist Robert Henri, here's a typical painting by Henri, Robert Henry, withdrew from the society, and the noted patron and collector John Quinn, who many of you know from the Yates Connection and Pound Connection, called it democracy run riot. The rationality of the no jury, no prizes policy governing the exhibition, the forward to the catalog explains, was based on the policy of the Société des Artistes Indépendants in Paris, founded in 1884. The Indépendants had cited the authority of none other than the most prominent of classical painters, Ingres, who had declared a jury, whatever the means adopted for its formation, will always work badly. The need of our time is for unlimited admission to the salon. I consider unjust and immoral any restriction tending to prevent a man from living from the product of his work. The great impressionist painter Renoir was also cited as an opponent of the prize system. No prizes, no juries. Therefore, everybody could be an artist. According to Article 2, Section 3 of the Bylaws of the Society of Independence, any artist, whether a citizen of the United States or of any foreign country, may become a member of the society upon filling an application, filing an application, therefore paying the initiation fee and the annual dues of a member and exhibiting at the exhibition in the year that he joins. The initiation fee was $1, the annual dues five, so today that would be more like probably 50 or even more. But anyway, for $6, any self-designated artist could therefore exhibit up to two works. For another $4, each artist could buy the space for one illustration in the catalog. Now, the response to this call for submissions was astonishing. The exhibition included 2,125, 2125 works by 1,235 artists, 821 men, 414 women, but more women than had been in the earlier show, still a lot less, arranged in alphabetical order regardless of manner or medium, although in practice the medium was predominantly oil painting, along with a few sculptures, drawings, and photographs. Among the 1,235 artists were some famous names from Picasso and Picabia to John Metzinger, Marsden Hartley, John Sloan, Arthur Dove, Charles DeMuth. Most of these, though, presented by earlier and lesser work, and hence not especially noted by the exhibition's reviewers. The vast majority, in any case, were entirely unknown. On the two-column list of P's in the catalog, Picabia is next to Love Porter, Picasso next to Alexander Portnoff. I always wonder whether that has anything to do with Portnoff's complaint, but I don't think so. But that was the name, anyway, of that artist. The dem democratic policy governing the exhibition elicited strong response. 20,000 people were reported to have filed through the galleries of the Grand Central Palace on Lexington Avenue during its month-long run from April 10th to May 6th. 20,000 people, a lot of people going to an exhibition at that time. Duchamp, whose New York reputation was still based primarily on his new descending a staircase, exhibited at the Armory Show of 1913, made no submission to the independent. 
But two days before the official opening on April 10th, an object titled Fountain was delivered to the Grand Central Palace, together with an envelope bearing the membership and entry fee of one Richard Mutt of Philadelphia. Duchamp and the company of Arensberg and Joseph Stella had purchased this object a few days earlier from the showroom of J.L. Mott Ironworks, a manufacturer of bathroom fixtures at 118 Fifth Avenue. It was a flat back Bedfordshire model porcelain urinal. Duchamp, Calvin Tompkins tells us, had taken it back to his studio, turned it upside down, and painted on the rim at the lower left in large black letters the name, you see it, R. Mutt, and the date, 1917. So that was the object. The reaction to this entry was electric. Bellows found the urinal obscene and refused to exhibit it. Aaronsburg praised its lovely form, but to no avail. At the zero hour before the opening, the 10-member board of directors met and voted by a small margin to turn down Richard Mutt's admission. When Glackens, the president, declared that it was by no definition a work of art, Duchamp and Aaronsburg immediately resigned from the board in protest. Fountain disappeared from the premises. No one could say what had happened to it. But a week later, it turned up in Stieglitz's 291 gallery, and soon, at Duchamp's request, and bear in mind that it was always Duchamp's request, the great photographer made the urinal immortal by photographing it in front of a painting by Marsden Hartley entitled The Warriors, see here it's sketched in, setting its smooth curve against the similar ogival shape in the painting so that it resembled a sculpture in a niche. It was soon dubbed by Duchamp's acquaintance the Madonna or Buddha of the bathroom. And that's a still of it. A photograph found in the Aaronsburg collection of the fountain cropped makes this point even clearer. So the Madonna Buddha of the bathroom. But why did Duchamp want Stieglitz to give his urinal this aesthetic dimension? It was a move in keeping with a related one. On the opening night of the exhibition, Duchamp declared that the two best paintings in the show were Louis Elshimius's Rosemary Calling, also known as Supplication, and Dorothy Rice's The Clare Twins. Yeah, but here are the Clare Twins. This judgment, cited the next day in the New York Sun by the art critic Henry McBride, was as widely quoted as it was